Are we back or what? But as they walk out, let's hear it for the low down brass band from Chicago. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. What a pleasure it is to finally be able to say that. I am Ruth Katz, Director of Aspen Ideas Health and Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Health Medicine and Society Program. I'm sure you share my excitement at being together again in Aspen three long years after we last met in person. And I know you are all so ready to dive into the incredible conversations, networking, and good times that clearly define this event. As we celebrate our return to campus, I want to begin by acknowledging on behalf of the entire Aspen Institute that we are meeting here on sacred lands, lands that have historically belonged to the Ute Indian tribes and native people whose culture remains vibrant today. We honor their legacy and that of all indigenous peoples and recognize their resiliency and determination to keep tradition alive and pass it on to future generations. I also want to begin by stating the obvious. These past few years have not been easy for anyone, and for far, far too many, COVID has brought really terrible tragedy. But we are here now, perhaps sobered, but definitely resilient, and I think it's safe to say many lessons have been learned. For one, we have seen up close the importance of staying healthy, the need to design effective health systems and the value of sustaining a robust scientific infrastructure have never been so apparent. And we have realized that heroes walk among us, and many of them are here today. Hats off to the amazing healthcare workers who toiled at great personal risk when a lethal infectious disease swept across the globe. Our deepest, our deepest gratitude as well to those who brought us an extraordinarily effective vaccine in record time. <laughs> Unfortunately, however, the pandemic also laid bare many of the fissures in our society. The uneven allocation of desperately needed protective gear, vaccines and therapeutics gave us a stark look at the consequences of inequities around the world. We saw the perils of loneliness, experienced the rising tide of violence, and confronted an alarming disdain for public health. And we saw what can happen when mental health issues are not adequately addressed, especially among our young people. Now we're going to be talking about all that and so much more here in Aspen, so I hope you'll join us to grapple with the many naughty challenges we are facing as a country, as a world, but be sure to carve out time for pleasure as well. Learn how technology is transforming healthcare. Patients are informing research and why animals are so important in our lives. There will be morning yoga, bird watching, art exhibits, book signings, and walks in the glorious maroon bells. We will be exploring the power of awe and the therapeutic potential of psychedelic drugs, gaining insider insights from top government leaders and considering what it means to individuals and society when people routinely reach the age of 100, and that is going to happen. Take in as much as you possibly can, but do leave time to reflect on what you're taking in and consider how best you can turn those reflections into actions that drive better health for all. None of this would be possible without our incredible underwriters, many of whom are longstanding supporters of Aspen Ideas Health, Please be sure to visit their exhibits spread around all of campus and attend some of the stimulating sessions they are here to offer. We are also thrilled that NBC Universal is our media partner for the first time this year. Their talented journalists will help bring broad attention to the work that we do here. And of course, and perhaps most importantly, we would not be together without all of you, our patrons and our pass holders. So many of you have told us how much you value our work, both professionally and personally, and that inspires us to just keep getting better. 
I think we would all agree that the world looks a little different now in so many ways, and you will see some changes as you walk around campus. We've adapted our programming to accommodate some of those changes, but be assured, please be assured, that much has remained exactly the same. The caliber of our agenda is as high as ever, and the enthusiasm that you, our committed audience, brings to this campus has not tired, not one little bit. I think you can see that. As always, we are joined by some of the best and brightest young people who are participating in various fellowship programs. Our speakers are still some of the most innovative thinkers and doers around the country, and not to worry, for those of you who've been here before, the hot dog guy is back. <laughs> You'll always find, I think you already know this, you'll always find great food and plenty of it. With that, I want to turn the conversation over to Natalie Johnson, or as I like to call her, the amazing Natalie. The woman who has made all of this that you're about to experience over the next three days happen. As Managing Director of Aspen Ideas Health, Natalie has invested an immense amount of creativity, knowledge, persistence, patience, and organizational talent to ensure that this program, Aspen Ideas Health, is unrivaled by anything else in the business. But before I do, a couple of closing comments. To those of you returning to Aspen Ideas Health, thank you for that loyalty. To our newcomers, I guarantee you, you will be thrilled that you have joined us. And to everyone, to all of you, dive in, please dive in to all we have to offer over the next three days Connect with colleagues and peers, learn from one another, be moved to act, and by all means, by all means, please enjoy what just might be our best Aspen Ideas Health ever. Again, welcome back. We are so glad to see you. Thank you all very much. generous introduction. Um, as she said, I'm Natalie Johnson, the Managing Director of Aspen Ideas Health, and wow, um, it feels almost surreal to have returned to this incredibly special place in these mountains, in this tent, celebrating this moment with this community. It's such a gift. Um, it took a lot of wildly smart, dedicated people behind the scenes to make this happen, people working hard and having fun as they shape something meaningful. I'm referring, of course, to the Aspen Ideas Health team. I wanna give a big shout out to all of them. In addition to Ruth, I wanna recognize Deb, Katie, Jamie, and Kathleen. Where are you? <laughs> probably, they're probably still working, um, but this is the core group that has worked tirelessly through every last detail of this event, um, so I'm so honored to work with them. Today, as I watched people come and go from the registration tent, I felt a deep sense of gratitude to have an opportunity like this over the next three days to talk to one another, to share our ideas, our experiences, our hardships, our hopes, to be together again. So as we launch Aspen Ideas Health 2022, I hope you'll challenge yourself to get out of your comfort zone, to introduce yourself to someone new, and to ask questions. So speaking of questions, I hope I can answer a few things now, um, but please know that we have a wonderful team of volunteers and staff. They're always available to help you have the best possible experience while you're here. Um, feel free to stop them on the path or reach out to us at any time. We wanna be sure you all get the most out of your experience. So first things first, if you haven't downloaded the Aspen Ideas app, please do that. Um, that will give you full access to the agenda, the speaker list, maps, exhibit information, and more. Um, if you log in, you'll have access to the Attendee Connect feature, uh, but you can also use the app without logging in. Um, if you need any help with the app, there's a tech help desk in the registration pavilion. Um, but as things change over the next few days, as they have for the past two years, um, <laughs> check the app because that is where the agenda will be continuously updated as flights get canceled or anything else happens. Um, and we'd love for you to engage with us on social media over the next few days. Um, you can use our Aspen Ideas channels. Our hashtag is Aspen Ideas Health. 
Um, next, for transportation, there are shuttles running from both sides of campus on loops through town. Um, they stop at key locations in town and they run continuously from 7.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. There are also WeCycle bike stations on both sides of campus. And if you're brave, grab one of those new e-bikes. You don't even have to pedal, I'm told. I haven't tried one yet. <laughs> Um, and of course, the one mile walk into town is lovely, so if you have time to stroll, I would encourage it. Um, as you all already know, we do ask that you wear your badge at all times during our event. Um, and last, but certainly not least, Ruth already mentioned it, but food. We wanna make sure you don't go hungry. <laughs> um, so we'll have a light breakfast every morning from 8 to 10.30, and lots of options for lunch across campus in the Door Hosier Center, the Marble Garden Tent, and the Blue Cross Blue Shield Tent in the Pepke Lawn. We'll have food trucks, hot dog carts, and snacks, so many snacks, hopefully you won't go hungry. <laughs> um, and don't forget you're at 8,000 feet, so you can never drink enough water. I highly encourage you to drink all of the water. <laughs> um, and again, we're here to help, so please don't hesitate to ask any of the volunteers or staff for assistance. Finally, to kick things off with a dose of inspiration, we are about to hear from some brilliant minds. Um, these are the folks that have been asked to share one big, bold idea with us. So without further delay, it is my very great pleasure to officially open Aspen Ideas Health with the 10 big ideas. Hi, uh, I'm Rob Knight, and I direct the Center for Microbiome Innovation at UC San Diego. And my big idea is that we should stop taking one of the most important sources of information that we have about the human body and literally flush it down the toilet. <laughs> what I'm talking about is the DNA, sorry, what, um, what I'm talking about is the DNA in the bacteria of our gut. Uh, and the big idea is that we should stop uh, literally taking this most important source of information about our bodies and flushing it down the toilet every day. Uh, you probably know about all the resources that have been invested, the billions of dollars in sequencing the human genome. But the truth is that only 1% of the genes associated with our body are in there. Uh, the other 99% are in bacteria and, uh, and other microbes in our digestive system. And what's amazing is that we're linking them not just to disorders of the gut that you might know they were involved with, uh, inflammatory bowel disorder, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and so on, but things that are maybe much more surprising to you, uh, including diseases of the heart, uh, diseases of the lungs, uh, cancer, uh, and even, uh, even psychiatric disorders including major, major depressive disorders and Alzheimer's disease. Um, so uh, so, so through, through, uh, through advances in technology, especially advances in DNA sequencing and uh, advances, um, and, and advances in, uh, in, in computation, we're able to capture all this information and make use of it finally for the first time. And not just at the individual level, but at the societal level to address health disparities. So for example, we're already monitoring the wastewater at UC San Diego and increasingly across the country uh, for COVID-19, which is not just in your lungs, but also in your poop. And uh, because everyone contributes to this data source, we can really address those health disparities by looking at it at the whole population level. So uh, Plato famously said that the unexamined life is worth not living. Uh, perhaps one day you'll think that the unexamined poop is not worth pooping. <laughs> Thank you. Hi all, my name is Megan Ranney. I am a practicing emergency physician, academic dean at the School of Public Health at Brown University, and senior strategic advisor to a firm at the Aspen Institute. I'm also a Health Innovators Fellow here. You may have seen me on TV talking about PPE, COVID vaccines, or gun violence, topics that many of us feel hopeless about and powerless to change. But what if I told you that there was a way to decrease gun deaths in our country by more than a third, regardless of what the Senate decides to do next? It sounds impossible, but it's not, and we have the data to prove it. In America, big change often starts small. Putting gardens into urban neighborhoods reduces firearm violence by 5%. ER docs like me counseling on firearms reduces the risk of fatal suicide attempts by up to two thirds. And public health partnerships with gun shops, 4-H and community organizations further reduce the risk of gun misuse. Bit by bit, these add up. Then others join in. Healthcare workers, firearm owners, small businesses, and through partnerships, individuals create community. 
Yes, it requires work, listening, showing up. But so does my job as an ER doc. And this is what public health should be. This is how we save lives. Now, what if I told you we can apply the same model to the opioid epidemic, the PPE crisis, getting people vaxxed, and yes, even misinformation? I say this because I've seen it. I've been part of it, and I know that it works. Listen, public health is ultimately about trust. And regardless of what we hear in the news, trust is something that we collectively know how to build. Driven by deep listening to the community, a belief in the power of the individual, a commitment to following the data, it starts with getting the right people in the room. So my big idea is that we actually do have the power to change the public's health, even on these very sticky issues, but we have to do it together. This is how we reduce firearm deaths and so much more. Thank you. I am Deo Gracia Sinizong Kiza, founder and CEO of Village Health Works. My big idea is reconciliation and peace building through health equity. American poet Maya Angelou wrote, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. I know how it feels to be sick and to have this wrenching pain in a conflicting zone in the root causes. One of our patients in Burundi recently told me, Hutus and Tutsis didn't kill each other. In a chronic, deep despair, with no access to health care, no food for our families, and no education for our children, we were used and abused, divided and misled. Instead of medicines and education, we were given guns and machetes to kill our own. Friends and neighbors turned in against each other. We became killers. In recent years, hundreds of thousands of Burundians were killed. Millions of people are haunted by trauma and fear of retribution. Imagine a world where the same sense of belonging, power, and purpose comes not from divisions and guns, but from building and owning something beautiful together. Imagine a life in a healthy, peaceful community learning skills that meant jobs and a dignity for your family. Imagine a world where citizens have more access to health care equity, not guns. Through the process of village health works, former enemies came together and started a healing from the trauma of war and renewed hope, relying on each other and remembering that they had more in common than what divided them. To end this wrenching pain, we must view health holistically through the lens of justice. Build dignified systems that respond to needs, collaborate with afflicted communities, and with each other. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Siobhan Westcott. I'm an Athabascan from Fairbanks, Alaska, and I am currently an endowed professor of American Indian Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. But I am here to give my big idea, and it is that we can have a standardized screening for racial bias in research and grants. I've already started it, and it, the ragtag team that we put together would make a great Disney movie. So we already have a six question screening for publications to prevent, for those of you who know this, if you don't look it up, the Wang paper, so that never happens again. And we actually had to add a question to say, is this paper racist? Because nobody had ever thought to say that in the 30 years of literature that we found. So that's my big idea. It's already underway and I look forward to getting any allies who wanna be a part of the ragtag team. Thank you. Hello all, my name is Bo Lotto. I'm a professor of neuroscience. Um, I'm a visiting scholar at NYU and a professor in London. 
So I study perception, so I study how the brain makes meaning and how we can apply the principles of how the brain makes meaning to expand our perception. So my big idea is actually something that you can actually apply every single day. Okay? It's very simple, but very hard to do. And it has to do with conflict. Conflict is one of our biggest challenges. And the problem is not conflict. Conflict is a beautiful thing. We only ever learn through conflict. So the problem is not conflict, it's how we enter it in the first place. So if, how do we enter conflict normally? If Natalie and I were in conflict, of course we would never would be, right? Because she's so patient, right? But if we're in conflict, what do we usually do, right? We're, we put each other at opposite ends of the same line. It's like, I want to prove that you're wrong and to shift you towards me. The problem is you're trying to do exactly the opposite. Prove that I'm wrong and to shift me towards you, right? So we enter conflict with the desire to win but not learn. Your brain only ever learns when it moves. Right? So what's the big idea? What would happen if instead of entering conflict with an answer and with certainty, we entered conflict with a question, with a desire to understand, right? rather than be validated? And when you seek understanding, you can actually talk to anyone. If you seek validation, there are very few people you can talk to, right? <laughs> so enter the conflicts with your partners, with your children at work, with a question and the desire to understand because you might actually learn something and expand what you think you know, okay? That's the idea. Good afternoon, my name is Haley Hardcastle. I'm a youth mental health activist and an education policy student. <laughs> my big idea is social emotional learning in every school across the United States. Social emotional learning, or SEL, is the practice of, um, it is the practice of expanding beyond traditional learning um, and including, in, sorry, um, and in, in <laughs> Sorry, the reason why I'm here talking today is because I actually have an anxiety disorder. Um, and social emotional learning is the reason why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> My mental health journey began when I was just six years old. I was diagnosed with trauma-induced anxiety. And I was really lucky that my school was one of few back then that was already practicing SEL. Um, as a low-income student, that is the only place that I was able to access mental health resources. So again, that's the reason why I'm able to do things like this today. My experiences inspire me to continually advocate for mental health resources for future students. SEL is the practice of including lessons regarding mental health, self-awareness, and interpersonal skills in lessons that are already taught in the classroom. SEL is essential in creating positive future health outcomes for our students. We all know that education is one of the largest social determinants of health. SEL works to close gaps in educational outcomes caused by racial, economic, and gender disparities. It is proven to work. I am proof of that. It has positive impacts on social skills and is correlated with a decrease in bullying and violence. It proves that students um, can manage stress and depression better, improves their attitude about themselves, others, and school. It is also proven that it can work cross-culturally and with a wide age range of students. Now, I know what you're all thinking. We can't ask teachers for more. The budget is already <laughs> really small. But SEL is worth investing in. It is proven that there's an average $11 return on every $1 invested into SEL lessons due to reduced societal costs for public assistance, housing, police, and detention centers. At this time, very few states have SEL standards, and the ones that do are pretty outdated. Together, we can improve our net understanding of mental health and raise the next generation of more emotionally intelligent and socially connected adults. Social emotional learning is health equity. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jerome Adams, and I am the director of health equity at Purdue University. You've all heard that the United States spends more than any other nation on health care. $10,000 per person compared to $4,000 per person for the OECD or rich countries average. But did you know that way back in 1995, the other OECD nations surpassed the United States in terms of life expectancy? We spend more than twice as much 
per person for health care, but live on average two years less. Four years less if you're an African American, and even less than that if you're an indigenous person. We have the highest suicide rate and twice the obesity rate of other OECD nations. This is what we call the US health disadvantage. And did you know that 49% of the US population receives employer-sponsored health insurance? So poor physical and mental health is impacting our nation's economic bottom line. Healthcare is the number two expense behind salary for most employers. And did you know you actually pay more for health care than you do for steel when you buy a General Motors car? Think about that for a second. You will hear lots of health stats over the next few days, but you will hear almost no business stats. My idea is for us to better track the business and economic impacts of health policies and engage employers to build healthier communities. And that's why when I was Surgeon General, I partnered with the UVA Darden School of Business to put out a first of its kind report on this issue, which I hope you'll check out at SurgeonGeneral.gov. The economy is the top issue ranked by voters in elections consistently, particularly so among independents and Republicans, but even in the last election also among Democrats. Want proof I'm right? Well, just six weeks ago, Dave Ricks, the CEO of Eli Lilly, talked about Indiana's core health rankings in the context of workforce and economic development, and it got national coverage. Y'all, I've been talking about this for eight years. I didn't get the coverage that he got. <laughs> Why is that? Well, it's not because he leads a health-related organization. It's because he's one of the largest employers in the state of Indiana. We have to stop talking to each other and learn to speak to our real target audience. That's my big idea, and thank you for having me here at Aspen Ideas. Hi, I'm Shoshana Ungerleiter. I'm a practicing physician, the host of the TED Health podcast, and founder of the nonprofit Endwell. My big idea is building a movement to make the end of life a part of life. Five years ago, I came here to Aspen Ideas on a mission. I knew that I wanted to improve the end of life experience, but I didn't know how. In America, bad deaths, the kind that don't match our wishes or values, are the norm. 80% of people wish to die at home. Only 30% actually do. More than 60% of people die in pain. The problem is, unless you opt out loudly and often, you can end up on a conveyor belt of care that takes you through increasingly invasive treatments even in the last days or hours of your life. It often finds physicians like me performing CPR on frail older people, breaking ribs in the process. It leaves family members racked with guilt that their loved one was alone and in pain when they died. So I came here and listened to all the different voices from medicine to politics, art, and business, hoping that something would click, and it did. I realized that improving the end of life experience isn't just a medical issue, it's a cultural one. We have to challenge the entrenched beliefs and behaviors that made it normal for us to avoid critical conversations about dying and turn the end of life into a medical experience rather than a human one. We need to reframe the end of life as a part of life. And that's why I started Endwell. We host convenings and create content with expert voices alongside the stories of everyday heroes. Our goal is to destigmatize end of life discussions and advance new ideas to allow more people to end well. Over the past year, we've explored how psychedelic medicines can shape human-centered experience and approaches to care at end of life. We're also studying cultural representations of death, illness, and grief in television and film, looking at how popular media can drive culture and behavior change. So while you're here in Aspen, notice the way we talk about death and dying when we do at all. Is it in medical terms or human ones? Imagine what would be possible if we saw ending well as a measure of living well and made it our collective goal to ensure that every person can leave this world with the dignity, love, and joy that we all deserve.
Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Sammy Ramsey, newly, uh, newly minted endowed professor of entomology at CU Boulder and a National Geographic explorer. And my big idea is for us to learn from our mistakes. And in order to explain to you what I mean by this, I would like for you to go with me on a very brief journey through a thought experiment. I'd like you to just close your eyes for a moment and imagine a hypothetical world where an infectious disease has ravaged populations. Where, <laughs> let's say this, uh, this disease originated in one part of the world, we'll hypothetically say Asia. And then it moved around the world, destroying lives and livelihoods. Now, of course, I'm sure you've all figured out that I'm talking about the parasitic infectious disease Varroa destructor that is killing our pollinators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you all figured it out, clearly. But here's the thing. It didn't have to go down that way. Had we invested time, effort, and energy in understanding that this parasitic mite was going to destroy populations of our bees, we could have prevented so much suffering in the populations of organisms that contribute $18 billion to the United States economy, $270 billion to the global econ economy, and stabilizes food security around the world. With funds that I crowdsourced, I was able to go to Southeast Asia and, uh, and actually study the new uh, pollinator pandemic that is emerging uh, that is a huge threat to our pollinators. Those funds had to be crowdsourced because there is no money currently available for that kind of work to be done preventatively. We invest $11.3 million every year in just treating the symptoms that our pollinators are suffering. We lose between one third and nearly 50% of our honeybees every single year, and it is preventable. So my big idea, why don't we try an ounce of prevention this time? We know what's coming. In the two years that I have been studying uh, the next pollinator pandemic, I have already found two novel remediation methods that have worked effect effectively to remediate this issue. And we can continue to do this, but it does need to be funded. Let's put our money into prevention rather than constantly trying to treat the problems that crop up. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Arshia Khan, professor and director of graduate studies uh, for computer science. She's stretching, by the way, um, at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So I'm introducing Pepper here, who's going, Paprika, actually, this is Paprika. She's going to give out the big idea and the brains behind the idea. My name is Pepper, and my big idea is me. <laughs> I'm an emotional support robot. I believe that humanoid robots like me can be incredibly helpful to residents of nursing homes by augmenting their care and helping them combat loneliness. I am built with facial recognition and natural language processing algorithms, which means I can connect faces to names and have conversations with residents. I can even tell jokes, and like an Amazon drone, I am always working on my delivery. <laughs> um, it went over better at the robotics lab. My main job is helping patients with dementia by offering reminiscence therapy. I listen patiently, helping my conversational partners relive memories from the past, and I don't mind repeating myself or listening to the same story again. I am never in a bad mood or frustrated or distracted, and I can talk for hours with no fear of catching or spreading an infectious disease. 
I'm also great at getting people moving. Come to my session tomorrow morning to see my little brother now teach yoga, tai chi, and even strength training classes. I'm also a pretty good dancer, though I prefer to leap. My programming has been thoughtfully developed by a large team of specialists, including computer scientists, ethicists, psychologists, nurses, graduate students, and more, all with the goal of improving care, both physically and emotionally, for aging adults. I'm not meant to replace the critical care provided by trained staff, but to help fill the gap that has arisen with workplace shortages. And of course, I'll never replace human to human contact, but when someone's feeling lonely and needs some interaction, I'm ready to roll in. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Porterfield, president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. And it's very tough to follow a robot. <laughs> Thank you so much. And please join me in thanking all of those who presented big ideas today. <laughs> and I guess my big idea is that all of you in convenings like this one play a decisive role in the building of a free, just, and equitable society, which is our mission here at the Aspen Institute. There's no substitute for dialogue, debate, facts, science, research, inclusion, questions, collaboration, learning from mistakes, and yes, principled disagreement in the service of building a more perfect world. That's what democracy is all about, and it's what the Aspen Institute is all about. So that's why we're so excited about this convening and the chance to be back together with all of you in person after a couple of very hard years. Let me begin by thanking Ruth, Natalie Johnson, Elliot Gerson, their teams, and many from across the Institute for their tenacious work to be able to bring us back together. Thank you so much to all of you. One time, William Butler Yeats wrote a poem celebrating the greatest leaders in Ireland. And he called them, and I quote, those passionate, serving kind. You Google that line right now, and you'll see a picture of Ruth Katz. Thank you. I also would like to thank today our underwriters, our partners, our speakers, all of you as guests. We have a number of trustees who have been deeply supportive of this opportunity to come together including Sonia Kapadia, who's here, Laurie Tisch, Ann McNulty. I think Mount Sinai CEO Ken Davis is either here or will be soon. He's one of the greatest public servants I've ever worked with as he dedicated himself and his team to saving so many lives in New York and around the country. And we're all here to protect public health and promote the public good globally with honest, factual information. We're all here to understand and address the social determinants of health inequities. We're all here to empower communities to frame and solve their own problems and learn together as a trusting, beloved community. We're all here to lift health equity back on the national agenda, even though, realistically, there are so many other things also to worry about in a world that's wobbling like a top. There have been so many devastating lessons that have come to us over these past two and a half tragic years, with more than a million pandemic deaths just here in the richest country in the history of countries. But pessimism, cynicism, fatalism, 
finger pointing, not my problemism, none of that is the answer. The answer is all of us in public health, in medicine, in business, in education, in philanthropy, in government, in the arts, and in every community coming together in that spirit of pluralistic, humanistic optimism. The next few days give us the chance to be that and do that together as we work on how health misinformation affects health, how the intersection of gun violence and public health has to be worked on even more purposefully, how the impact of the climate crisis on health here all around the world, how to prevent the next pandemic, how to promote global health in the most inclusive and egalitarian way possible, and how all of these different crises and others intersect together to require our best work, rolling up our sleeves together in that spirit of optimism that we here can make a difference. It's also for me personally an incredible privilege to be here today because we have two HHS secretaries who are with us and who served so well in their time in office. First, we have Alex Azar who is here today and thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. And then secondly, we have my former boss and mentor, the 18th Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala. So Donna served every single day of the Clinton administration, eight years, every single day. And some of the greatest lessons I've ever learned in public service and in life came from my proximity to another of those passionate serving kind. I have to admit I'm a little nervous right now because this is the first time I've ever spoken in public in front of my former boss. <laughs> and she's a kind person, but still, you've all had mentors in your lives and you know what it's like. So I was thinking, how am I gonna get through this? And I called up um, this friend of mine named David Letterman. <laughs> I told him the situation. He's like, you're in, you're in trouble, Porterfield. So he said, well, what's so great about Shalala? So I told him a few things. And he said, okay, well, good luck. This might be your end of days. Um, but then a couple of days later, my email, I got an inbox from David Letterman. Opened it up. Inside, the his gave me back the top 10 words of wisdom from HHS Secretary Donna Shalala. <laughs> so let me give them to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Number 10, make sure the table is inclusive so that everyone can help frame and solve the problem. Number nine, always include the civil servants in the work that the political appointees are entrusted to carry out. It will lead to better policy and better practice. Number eight, check your egos and your privilege at the door. This is about the public good. I, I imagine you might be thinking, did I say that? <laughs> Everything here is right from the mouth of Donna Shalala. Number seven, the best solutions demand that we work across the aisle. Number six, Fund and practice prevention. Yeah. Number five, David Letterman again, top 10 reasons. Number five, invest in science and build systems to measure and track results. Yeah. Number four, speaking of systems, our policies should not be one-offs. They're interrelated and their impacts are integrated. Number three, it's important to make steady, incremental progress and, this is a big one, I've never forgotten this, always be ready to take the big step when it's possible. <laughs> Number two, our policies need to be about children, youth, and families. Adults need to help protect them. And the number one word of wisdom from HHS Secretary Donna Shalala to those of us lucky enough to work with her and to be with her today, a good idea, 
is when it comes to public service and public leadership, make a difference every single day and have fun. Great lessons to live by, to work by, and to kick off a conference with. Thank you all for being here. Have a great time. Now let me turn it back over to the band to lead us to the reception. Thank you, everybody.